Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for coming today to Event Hub's uh, first ever virtual summit. We're very, very excited to have everybody here today. And we have fantastic speakers throughout the day, really great programming opportunities to network with your peers. We also have a bunch of associations that are a, a huge part of our community that we're really excited to be supporting. Our goal today are to give you resources and tools to be able to help you if you have to produce virtual and hybrid events, if you're looking to the opportunities to produce virtual and hybrid events, to have some tool set and expert knowledge to be able to do that. And then also to help as we're all strategizing how to come back in 2021 better than ever before. Without further ado, I'd like to get right into our keynote panel because every minute these folks have to talk on the mic, we should be listening to them. Um, very honored today to have three distinguished guests. We have John Welsh, who is from the New York Roadrunners, produces the TCS New York Marathon and the Expo. He is the manager of experiential events. We have Sam Kimball, who's the president of Winship Media and the founder of New York Wine Events.com. And Shelly Bennett, who's the manager of Pierce County Fair in Washington. Um, the first thing I'm going to do is go around and have them each tell you a little bit about themselves, their organization, and also what they did for their events in 2020. Um, Shelly, I'd love to start with you. Well, thank you. I'm happy to be here and thank you for the opportunity to share. Um, so I've managed the Pierce County Fair since 2016, although I've been involved in fairs pretty much all my life. And we're a smaller fair as far as fairs go, about 20,000 in attendance in 2019. And um, we have uh, probably over 500 exhibitors. And I'll just notate that when a fair person talks exhibitor, they're not talking about people that are demonstrating um, and your vendors, but we're talking about youth and adults that are bringing their items to the fair. So we have these people that all year are working on their projects, working with their animals and gearing up to show at county and state fairs. And for that reason, we felt like we had to do something um, this year in 2020. Um, it was morphed along as, you know, many of you know that, you know, the decision process was tough. You know, at first we thought, you know, will we be able to have anything? Maybe we can do a hybrid, um, you know, and as it got closer and closer realizing that, you know, doing it totally virtual was going to have to be the option, although we had no idea what that looked like. So it was a big leap of faith. And um, so for those exhibitors, for our vendors, for our community, um, we wanted to do something and Event Hub came along with this idea and we grabbed at it as an opportunity to be able to showcase um, these exhibits, <clears throat> excuse me, as well as um, highlight our entertainers. You know, many of you know that these people, that's their um, livelihood. And so to be able to help them as well was our goal. So, and we wanted to be as real as possible. So we wanted to have the barns, the buildings, um, the places you would go to um, view the animals and the items, the quilts, the flowers, whatnot. And so we used the booth platforms, not only for our vendors, but also for those buildings and barns. So you could go in and look at the different items. And that was um, very well received. Um, we had um, over 15,000 views during our four day fair, which um, was pretty exciting. And from not only our area, but all over the United States and some from even out of the country. So it was, uh, it was a very exciting thing and we were glad that it had such a good response because it, you know, it was a lot of work and you know, bringing that together, especially with no base to um, start from, you know, we never even imagined in our wildest dreams that a county fair would be virtual. So that's where we took it and glad that we did. Thank you so much. Uh, Sam, I'm gonna kick it to you next and then we'll, we'll uh, kick it to John. Well, thank you for having us, Michael. Uh, it's a pleasure to, to join this, this panel and, and a couple of, uh, of um, awesome other organizations. So New York Wine Events, uh, which has been around for 10 plus years, um, is a leading food, wine and culinary experience uh, website and and, and um, destination for um, events that are in the culinary food wine space. And in a normal year, we do 
um, anywhere from eight to nine different culinary wine and food festivals. And this year, obviously, you know, that's, that's on hold. Um, we only did one event in the winter. And um, starting in April, as things, you know, became clearer that the pause was going to be relatively long, um, we kind of realized that we have an active online audience and um, a destination website and social feeds um, and an email list. And we needed really to, to provide uh, a service to our audience, both in terms of information. Um, our mission is discovery and education about food and wine and all things culinary um, and, and, and artisan makers. And so it was clear that we needed to you know, keep an active flow of content coming to, to the audience. Um, so we started doing virtual tastings, um, which were, you know, we do sometimes two and three uh, virtual tastings a week. Uh, we've done 50 plus since April. And then as that program really took off um, and we were getting good engagement from the audience and from our sponsors, um, we said, you know, a couple of those big food, wine and culinary festivals um, we should uh, do virtually and, and, and help people with discovery and education about craft food and craft beverage through our festival brands. So this fall, we are doing two, we've already done one, um, virtual food and wine festivals, and we're using Event Hub as, as the platform. Uh, we do a lot of live streaming around those um, experiences within Event Hub as well. Um, and um, the second one we're doing is coming up, we're, we're taking our Brooklyn Crush Wine and Artisanal Food Festival and doing a holiday edition in December. Um, and what this has done for us is in addition to the virtual tastings um, uh, um, being you know, a service to our audience, um, we do those, those are smaller. It's, we'll focus on a one, one, one winery and we'll do an hour once, you know, once or twice a week. And we've done, you know, 50 plus wineries and, and craft um, beverage and food makers. Um, you know, those are great, but doing the festival allows us to create an opportunity for even more enhanced selling for the exhibitors. Um, and Event Hub is, is um, well uh, positioned and constructed for that. Um, and last but not least, our, you know, all of the above has been useful for um, and, and really helped build our relationship with our sponsors. Um, the, the unintended good consequence of all of this is that both with the virtual festivals on Event Hub, but also with um, the, vir the virtual tastings we do weekly, we're no longer just a Northeast US company in terms of audience, we now reaching people across the country. And that's exciting and fun and um, kind of lends itself to like in the future, um, we see even as physical events come back, we see continuing to have a virtual component, even with the festival events, um, because um, we're bringing what we do to a larger a larger group of people and giving them the opportunity to discover and, and learn about these awesome craft food and beverage companies. That seems like a perfect segue to kick it to John who helps run one of the largest, uh, the largest marathon in the world <laughs> uh, and love to understand the same thing. So, so how did you approach 2020? What were your core objectives? Um, and then we'll, we'll start looking at the future after that. Yeah, and again, to echo everybody else, thanks. This is an, an honor and a privilege to, to be a part of the, the panel here and with, um, with my colleagues in the event industry. It's definitely a strange and unknown time and, and future, so um, happy to be here and, and discussing all things events and, and kind of how we can band together as um, colleagues and partners in this um, wonderful industry. So as mentioned, yep, I, I work for New York Road Runners and we're in New York, we're a premier running organization and we're responsible for planning some of the largest road races in the world. So our, our biggest and most well-known is the TCS New York City Marathon, um, which was supposed to happen at the beginning of this month, uh, which I'm sure we'll talk much more about. That had to go virtually as much of all of our lives had. Um, and our roadrunners were really committed to 
helping and inspiring people through running. So throughout the course of a year, we would have had major races throughout all five boroughs of New York City. We would do weekly races. We have community and youth programmings that encourage movement and activity. And for the last seven months, we've really had to understand and, and re analyze what that looks like in the current environment. So um, I actually was in the venue setting up for the New York City Half um, Expo in March when New York City shut down. I was installing carpet when I got the phone call and it was it was um, time stopped as as you all have seen over the you know the news in, in New York City. Um, and we have really taken a hard look at what since March you know, where our pain points are with pivoting into this new virtual world and how do we continue to bring the in-person experience and the iconic New York City backdrop to those that are running wherever they are virtually throughout the world. And that's been a real challenge. Um, and I think we'll talk a little bit more about sponsorship engagement. And that also has been a real challenge. And I think platforms like Event Hub have been a saving grace for us to continue to explore how do we evolve and continue to brand or to bring brand and, and sponsorship aware, awareness and engagement to the virtual space? So we, you know, to be perfectly frank, are still very much within those having those conversations as an internal organization about how do we continue to bring the excellent races and the excellent in-person events and how do we continue to engage the virtual, the virtual world, which to Sam's point is not going to go away and has actually grown some audience members that would not have been able to to touch us and to feel us and to experience all that we have had to actually create in, in person in New York City. So um, we are very much having those conversations. And I think that um, it's at a really exciting time to kind of reinvent yourself um, and, and, and kind of looking forward into what 2021 will bring in the hybrid events of virtual and in person. It's a real tall order. Um, it's, it's definitely hard to kind of continue the engagement in the virtual space when events are made and, and the bread and butter is the the enhancement of what it is to engage with our, our fellow humans and make memories and make experiences. And um, that's been a real challenge for us, but I think that we have laid some groundwork in, with our most recent virtual expo for the TCS New York City Marathon, which was on Event Hub. I think we really have set some good foundational stones for us to look forward in the future. Thank you, John. Uh, I'm going to go in reverse order coming back around and talking a little bit more about 2021 plans. Before I do that, though, I want to ask that if anyone has any questions, drop them into the live chat. Uh, we have a team member that's feeding me questions from the live chat, and we're definitely looking forward to answering some of those questions and furthering the, the discussion as we get through our prepared remarks. So John, um, I'd love if you could, I think you dug into it a bit with some of the learnings that you had, and I know we had in our prep portion, some really good discovery as well. What were some of your key discoveries from 2020 and maybe some surprising observations and how are those really informing and shaping your strategy and the way you're approaching uh, designing your events for 2021? Yeah, and I think that this is, uh, the pandemic has accelerated trends that we, um, if we're honest with ourselves, may have been feeling and may have seen crop up in our event recaps or our, you know, re recaps with sponsors and partners and, and even venues. Um, I think that this pandemic has really accelerated trends that were already brewing and has made us uh, reckon with those much, much quicker and much force, much more forcefully than we would have had to have in, in the before times, as I call them now. Um, so for us, the, the biggest change for our in-person expos is, is how are we going to continue to develop and, and create those wonderful moments with continued sponsor engagement and fulfillment um, when in our experience with New York City being New York City and a lot of venue operations and unions and all that comes with New York City, um, it's getting harder and harder for us to sell a show floor in the traditional sense of 10 by 10 booths um, that, you know, populate a, a floor square footage of 135,000 square feet. Um, that has been a struggle for us as we continue to see trends move into the more experiential realm of what does it look like to have brand experiences as opposed to just brand uh, selling at, in booths. So we're seeing this real interesting trend and we're trying to understand how can we 
design an experience that fulfills all of these checkboxes that we have to, but also leaves runners with that Instagrammable moment or that shareable element that they're going to be putting on all of their social media feeds, as well as cater to those that are looking for the tchotchkes and the 10 by 10. So there's a real marriage there that we're still discussing and still discovering. Um, I think this pandemic has, has made us realize that, and to bring some optimism here, you know, the event industry had been booming and, and the racing industry had been booming. The pandemic has made it all more important when you take away the in-person events, how important those in-person events really are. So the desire is, I think, higher now more than ever once we come out of the pandemic and we're allowed to, to be in the presence of each other again. Um, when we do go back to our kind of normal scheduled programming, I think it's, there's going to be some skepticism around in-person events and how our attendees feel, is it worth it for them to come? And I think we're gonna really have to elevate our game in all of those aspects that I just mentioned to make that experience for them worth them, you know, coming to and, and, and um, trying to get back to as much as normal as possible. I think that's a good point. One of the key themes that we've seen at different uh, racing trade shows throughout the year was how are we making the expos exciting and an experience? How are we making the run more of an experience? And I think to your point, this definitely accelerated that trend and, and made it really mandatory so that you have to have something compelling and awesome for attendees to come live to. Um, two things I wanted to hey, follow Michael, up I, with. Michael, I have a question. What, what would be, and I'm curious, John, what you guys came up with too, but I totally agree with that thought that the booths, whether they're virtual or at the physical event, when the physical events come back, have to be more than just high, buy our stuff mm -hmm. what were some of the things michael that you saw for example in the virtual realm and john that you started thinking about or the team started strategizing about that fulfilled that that goal and sorry to, for a complex question but when you overlay that with um and i'm sure that everyone on this panel has had this realization with the realization that the exhibitors, there's a wide range of capability in terms of A, their marketing um, mm -hmm. strategy and expertise, mm -hmm. but also their technical expertise as it relates to activating their booth, their virtual booth. So that was the challenge yeah. that we found. We, we were like urging exhibitors to think of ways to have a call to action that was captivating and compelling which right speaks to what you and uh john was talking about michael but then there was a separate issue in the virtual execution and we ended up our team just ended up taking over building most of the virtual booths ourselves yeah uh, which was we had some people who you know can do email but not much more and then we sure. had other people who like you know, somebody related to the principal, and these are all family run businesses, so they're small. Somebody related to the principal owner is like a, a web engineer. So that booth was awesome. Right. So I, sorry for the complicated question, but it-, it No, no worries. You know, it, it, it gets to the heart of what we're talking about because we're talking about like virtual becoming something that sticks around and it should. Yeah. And we're talking about activation in the real world when physical events come back that has more than just, hey, buy our stuff. How do we carve that path to success mm -hmm. so that all of the exhibitors are benefiting from that kind of thinking? So I'll, I'll take first crack at that if, if it's okay. Uh, and definitely the festival and fair industry are, are less, I would say that the exhibitors on average, at least, at uh, races and marathons, because tech has really been threaded through the industry from the timing side and other aspects, they're a bit more sophisticated and tech savvy to start pre-pandemic, right, than, than fairs and festivals. I do think that, as you all know, we were just talking about how all of us are Zoom experts now, that we've all been become quickly much more comfortable with technology. I think as we look at the next six months, people will really force themselves to educate and to, to be better at it. But for us, the, the events that we've seen be the most successful, you have to put a ton of time and energy and really invest in educating and training and coaching all of your partners on best practices. Uh, 
John, if you want to tag onto that, I'd love to, to hear some good thoughts. I know that some of your exhibitors did some really cool things, everything from, I think there was a, a exhibitor selling shoes with the Snapchat augmented reality feature and, and everything like that too, right? Yeah, and I, I actually, Sam, I think that's um, an exceedingly good question to ask. I think the first six months of the pandemic was everybody trying to figure out, okay, well, how do I move everything onto the virtual space? How do I move everything into the virtual space? Now that we've been living there for six or seven months, I think the real next frontier is how do we pivot to make that as an engaging element that isn't gonna replace in-person events, but that is an opportunity for us to build into new markets or to new audiences that is just as engaging and just as meaningful as the in-person events were. And I think that's a really hard, I, I, I've been struggling a lot with our teams about that, of how do we rethink the virtual landscape is not just, you can run a virtual 4K anywhere in the world, which is great and excellent. And we're glad that people are running, but how do you make it a tangible experience for NYRR that that's our race. And I think, I don't have the answer, but I think that that is where the next six months of severe investigation can really transform the virtual space in a sense of events and how do you marry the two? So we, um, one of our most successful engaging elements using Event Hub and the virtual expo platform for the marathon that we just wrapped up a week or two ago we had a finisher results wall where we had announcers actually read the results of those that ran. Now there was, we did say, go to this booth to submit via, you know, a form, your name, where you ran, your time. We had to verify all of that. We don't want to read somebody having broken a sub two, you know, two hour marathon. And that's just, as of yet, <laughs> um, very, 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 very hard to do. So we had to, you know, verify all this and it took some time, but we tried to make that as personable as possible in this crazy myriad of virtual worlds. So, you know, um, Michael ran in Seattle, a time of two hours and 45 minutes. Wow, that's really fast, congratulations. You know, like, feel free to tell us more about your running stories at, you know. So there was an element that we attempted to make a real personable call out and shout out in a can be very isolating virtual world. Um, Boston also did something very similar for their marathon and they had this after party that was like a newscasting and that was again a very, and it was an attempt at making that much more engaging. Um, looking to the future, we have excellent partners, New Balance is with us, TCS, we have apps, we have a lot of different elements that we're trying to kind of all move into one strategy um, and we're not cannibalizing each other on, you know, internally. So, uh, I don't have an answer, but that is something that I think will define the next six months, seven months, eight months of kind of this pandemic crazy world of how do we, how do we transition to not just putting things virtually, but then making them actually an impactful and another kind of appendage of your industry. I, I'll get off my soapbox in just a minute. The, the gaming industry has done a really interesting shift with including like Travis Scott did this in, in console performance. And I, I'm not an intense gamer, but I'm reading all about these things. There's elements of incorporating in real life experiences into the virtual world. And I think marrying them is really where that discussion and, and strategy needs to occur. Um, mm -hmm. It's the million dollar question. Yeah, we've seen that a lot. One of the things that's happened a ton in the racing industry is what we call these surprise and delight or stoke boxes or something like that, where you're not just sending a medal, you're sending a medal, you're sending a t-shirt, you're sending samples, tangible things they can hold in their hands and try from some key sponsors to bring it home for them. And then they can potentially engage with elements you're mailing to their home through the virtual piece. Um, Sam, I want to turn it over to you for a moment. So tell us this same question uh, that we started off with and, and great follow-up, by the way. So what were some of the key observations that you've made thus far in 2020 and how are you approaching your events in terms of, uh, in your case, I would say balancing this new national or global audience with still focusing on your core uh, regional and, and local stakeholders? Yeah, um, that's a lot. <laughs> I, I mean, I think the, the key thing, the, the big takeaway has been one that that virtual doesn't replace physical events, um, but 
there are elements of the virtual events that one would have thought were just not replacement for, substitute for, that have been much more um, compelling and engaging for the audience than we suspected. So for example, you know, we'll have, you know, Michael and Company Winery on the show, our weekly show, the live stream, and we have people tuning in who ne have never seen us before, and we have people tuning in who have watched plenty of our broadcasts, ret returning viewers. And what we've learned, which, you know, was super interesting was, we spent an hour with Michael and Company Winery and the winemaker, people buy wine. They're not tasting it. Um, they've had, if, if we have had enough time before the event to promote it and promote pro the wine selections and, and the winery, some of them may have pre-ordered it before the tasting, but they'll hear about these particular selections and they'll hear the winemaker talk about them and they'll see a photograph, like the one in my background of the vineyard. And they'll be like, you know what? There's, a, there's an interesting incentive offer that is part of the live stream. I can get three bottles and 20% off and flat rate shipping anywhere in the US. These guys seem like they make great wine. I'm gonna order the three bottles. So that was something that was a revelation and it was not one we expected. And then somebody on, our, on my team said, you know, you know, when you go to the wine store and your local friendly wine store clerk says, you say, well, I'm looking for a Chardonnay. And she says, you know, there's this famous one, but there's this other one that's not, not it's five bucks less or 10 bucks less. And it's even better. And it's from a small producer in Oregon. You know, you buy it. You haven't tasted it. And so we made that connection. It was sort of interesting. Um, and it kind of comes back to what John was saying, like, what, what are you doing, you know, in your booth, whether at the physical event or these days in the virtual event that captivates the, the, the audience and the people coming in. And I think that, you know, there's some element of storytelling. I love the, you know, the, the finisher results wall idea. Um, you know, I, I'd love to learn more about that and how it was executed sort of logistically. Um, anything that gives people an opportunity to participate and be engaged. And so for us, that's been, you know, we pledge at the top of every broadcast. And, and also when we're doing the virtual festivals and live streaming on Event Hub, we pledge that if somebody's got a question, we will answer it right then on the fly. We're not gonna take questions at the end. Um, so that helps engage people. Um, we, sometimes we have fun with, with trivia or interesting information, but we need to do more of that. I mean, that that's, gets to what John was saying earlier, like what are you doing to create an engaging experience that draws people in and gets them to participate and not just watch or if it's a physical event just stroll by you know so and you know giving up and just saying oh we'll just wait till it comes back live it's definitely not the answer i i think you're 100 both 100 percent right in that the success of the of the event industry and the success of live events is dependent on how well we execute virtual programming and keep people engaged now because if we don't their mind's going to get, our, our audience is going to get their attention grabbed by other digital experiences that are available now. So we need to build these audiences. We yeah, need to keep I, them primed. I mean, John, you touched a nerve because, you know, this intersection of live and virtual, because live can learn from virtual where you have to have those hooks, those engagement moments. And so, you know, in, in the latter part of 2019, I think the second half and into the beginning of this year at our big festival experiences, we did some cool stuff with like live screen printing on site where we had like a screen printer doing, you know, literally screen printing shirts and bags and things right in front of you. And you could say, Oh, I, I'd like the 
tote bag that came with my ticket, but I want the logo or the, and the thing, the printing in red or blue. That was like, you know, super engaging and it got people interested. So. Absolutely. Uh, Shelly, I want to talk to you about your plans for 2021. And one of the things we talked about in, in our prep call as well. So thinking about what you learned from 2020, um, I think your, your takeaway from before was that it was surprisingly successful, which you would have thought there would have been pushback for a fair community, but it was really cool that you were able to reach people that couldn't be there in person on a normal year anyway. So I think you'd mentioned really feeling the need to fulfill that for the, that audience that can't be there in person and keeping that going. Um, and I also want to talk about if you could, uh, it's a good segue into talking about some of those smaller businesses that comprise so much of your, your vendor population. Yes, it was uh, surprising. We mentioned that, um, well, and as opposed to Sam's group, we didn't really have a lot of online presence in the past. In fact, the fair, the Pierce County Fair was kind of just emerging into the digital age as a fair. It was only probably um, early 2000s that we even took debit and credit cards. You know, we were cash only until I think 2013. Um, you know, probably a quarter of our fair board, you know, is barely texting, you know, let alone um, online and whatnot. So, um, it definitely was a challenge and, you know, we were really unsure how this was going to work out uh, virtually with, um, you know, this kind of group and fairs in general are a very in-person touchy feely kind of thing. And that's what we want to encourage is people interacting with the community, with the agriculture and whatnot. And, um, so, you know, one of our biggest challenges was not only, you know, stepping into the unknown, but also having that tech support and the knowledge to be able to do something like this. And like I had said, we definitely learned a lot along the way and very grateful for that knowledge, but it was uh, a stretch to say the least. Now we did, um, like you mentioned, you know, we reached out across the United States and across the world with our visits. And that was just eye opening comments coming in from fa uh, family, friends and um, acquaintances that were like, you know, this is the first time I've ever seen, you know, my grandchild show their goat or, you know, their artwork or, you know, whatever it was. And they were just really grateful for that opportunity to um, engage with their you know, these people, and as well as locally, you know, there were people that used to come to the fair every year without fail, and maybe they can't for whatever reason, physically or distance. And so just to be able to step back in and relive some of those memories. Um, so we do recognize that as something we don't want to lose. And as um, kind of an extra audience, you know, we've been in a place where our fairgrounds and our parking is somewhat limited and always questioning, you know, yes, we want to grow and yes, you know, we accept these challenges, but where are we going to put all these people? And so by stepping into this virtual aspect of a fair, that's where a lot of people can come and visit the fair without having to park their car. Um, or, you know, maybe they're going to come back day two virtually. Maybe they came in person on day one to, you know, pet the goats and whatnot and to see those flowers in person. And, but day two, I'm going to come back because I want to see Kale Moon on the stage. And, um, but, you know, I don't want to drive that far again, or I don't, you know, um, you know, want to come out again for whatever reason. It also gives that opportunity um, being an outdoor event, which, you know, uh, a lot of us are in the event world, that if it's a weather issue to put more energy and time into the virtual show, so to speak, and still allow people that access to the fair where maybe um, it's going to rain today or it's a thunderstorm and I don't want to be outside, but yet I can still go to the fair. So, you know, those... Um, those perks from this um, are going to, you know, weigh on our future decisions. Um, you know, we can definitely see a need for a hybrid event moving forward. You never would have convinced me that in the past. 
you know, a fair is a very, you know, you can't get on the carnival ride virtually, although we did talk about maybe getting some first person ride videos going just to give, you know, some of the feel, but um, yeah, it's definitely, and for our vendors and our sponsors, um, because most of our local and community, their ability to reach outward or for us to help them reach further um, with their sales, with their branding, um, all of those things is, you know, it's just opened a big door for us. And um, I want to address a little bit of the challenge, like Sam was saying, with the vendors, um, getting them set up and going was one of our biggest challenges. And we didn't have a lot of vendors for our virtual event this last year, just because it was so um, quick and unknowing. And a lot of them were maybe your small town um, home-based businesses, you know, whether it was Tupperware or uh, Pampered Chef or whatnot. And they kind of thought, oh, I got this. I do this all the time, you know, these online parties. But um, just getting them to, you know, we're just like, call me, please, please, you know, jump on this training, you know, and I will help you in 10 minutes of your time. And, you know, I'm going to make a world of difference in your prep for your virtual booth. And um, we did actually take some of them and just like, you know what, just give me your info. I'm going to do it for you. <laughs> and um, because it really wasn't hard, but, you know, just pointing out the different um, aspects and the different things on the virtual uh, booth was all it took. And so getting that couple minutes of their time so that they could be prepped and ready and, and not thinking they could load it up the day before. So those were some of the things that we see in 21. And, um, you know, as much as hard as this year was, there are definitely some benefits coming out of it and some things that will help our fair grow in ways we had never even thought about before. Yeah, again, just you can't emphasize enough, I think across the group, encouraging training aggressively your uh, exhibitors budgeting for staff to help support and build out mm -hmm. the booths, make sure they have compelling experiences. Um, <clears throat> the video game note from earlier, you know, the, the term we hear a lot is gamification. How are you gamifying your experience to make it fun for people, not just informational, but really fun and engaging for people to want to go and, and explore that. Um, I want to, one thing we should definitely talk about is mobile. Because as much as we just assumed, I think, oh, everyone's gonna gonna do it to their, you know, pull it up on their desktop or their laptop computer. They're probably gonna even connect an HDMI cable to their 50-inch screen TV. And then what we found, I think, across the board, is more than 50% of attendees are just jumping on their phone. And if they want it bigger, they just hold it up in front of their face, three inches, right? And then they have a big screen TV um, because they're jumping on your rent from wherever they are, they're walking around the house or doing other things. So how, uh, how have you found mobile to be an impact for that? And then how do you think there are opportunities to, to program things that are still compelling on a mobile screen, for example, that will drive engagement? And that's for the group, not, not just for Jelly, certainly. Yeah, so that is definitely a challenge that, you know, we hadn't really thought about. And, um, you know, as far as engaging people, you know, we did uh, incorporate contests and scavenger hunts, um, especially something to try to drive people into the different booths and buildings. Um, so we would do a lot of scavenger hunts within them to get the visits up to each of the different uh, vendors that we had. But, um, you know, there's, it's a definitely a big world out there and our tech team is something we need to grow. And I've told um, our fair board specifically, if we're to do a hybrid event, we need to grow that team because honestly, the team that put on our virtual event is the team that usually puts on the live event and we can't do both. You know, I was like, that took, you know, pretty much a hundred percent of us to do that. And so to do both, we need, we need a whole separate team and preferably somebody with more experience. <laughs> a little bit of HTML and design goes a long way. By the way, as you're answering this question, in addition to mobile, I want to talk about what 
if anything, what elements have you found actually worked better in virtual? So for example, in the fair industry, I've heard that livestock auctions have, have sometimes been even more successful in virtual because more people can get in and participate. So what elements of your events were you surprised that worked even better virtual potentially than in person? Or what new elements did you add that just were a home run virtually? Well, entertainment was a surprising one, you know, as we, the majority of our entertainment, um, first of all, isn't big name just because of um, budget, space, security, the ability to um, separate it out. You know, we don't have a grandstand. Um, we operate out of a county park, actually. So um, our entertainment is typically kind of local and the main stage is free where online we see an opportunity to, you know, not only bring in a bigger name, but to spread that view out. Um, it's not just limited to a person who's gonna be there on the grounds on Friday, but now you can reach out to um, this unlimited audience that can come and enjoy this entertainment. And then within that, the majority of ours were pre-recorded. Um, which I was actually really glad we did just because it saved a lot of uh, stress and, and worry with the whole live streaming thing, you know, which was extremely new to us among the other things. And, and so, but within that, um, we had our local TV station actually helped create productions where it had a nice intro, it had different segments of the entertainment, intermixed in there were sponsor shout outs. And we offered, they could do kind of a 15 second video if they wanted to, or um, it could just be pictures or coupons or, you know, whatever. But we were able to then bring the sponsorship into there um, where normally on the main stage, you know, maybe that's not as big a reach and it's also not uh, mentioned as much. So um, that, was, that was a huge eye opener. Dan, what about for you? What were some things that you found worked really, really well on uh, virtual? I mean, I think, you know, looking at some other events that that have been you know, put up on the web um, as virtual versions of the physical experience. And based on my having worked in the live streaming video industry, for us, you know, the live stream was really important. Um, we felt that um, if you arrive on a festival landing page and there's a, there's a nice hero image and you scroll down and then you see all the different booths, but there's nothing live. Like there's, you, when you arrive there, nobody's saying anything. There's, there's nothing on the main stage that's happening. Well, in real time, that that was not a faithful um, simulation of an exciting live event. So for us, the live stream was critical. And, and you know, for the first event we did, we, were, we, we had two sessions. We were, you know, ran on two, two consecutive days and we ran for a couple hours each day. And for during those two hours, we were live. And the hero image at the top of the event hub landing page for the whole festival was the stream. And so there was no getting around it. You knew something was going on. Like you're walk, you know, walk down a street, and, you know, you pass a nightclub and the doors open and you can see in and like there's a band on stage and the lights are up and the music's pumping. Like, you, you know, you stop, you look in, you, know, you, you have to, in our view, in my view, you have to simulate that experience. So when somebody hits that landing page, they're like, okay, this is, this is happening right now. And we had some other events in our space. We had seen where there, you land on the page and it could have been, you know, even though it was the date of the event, it could have been any date. It could have been six months ago. It could have been six months from now. It didn't really matter. You were just on another web page, and there were there were tiles. There was like an expo area. You could click through to an exhibitor. That was it. Um, and also the other thing too for us, 
we really require the exhibitors to be live in their booths. So when they go enter a winery booth or a craft distillery or artisan food company, and they click on um, start live chat, like somebody's there and pops up on screen and says, hey, how you doing? And like they start talking about, you know, what's in the booth. Um, that was another thing we saw in some other events and other experiences, not necessarily, not necessarily all of which were on Event Hub, a couple were. You go into a booth and not only was there not a live stream on the main page, but there wasn't anybody in the booth. So again, like that, that didn't feel like an event. Um, so that was, that was sort of key for us. Uh, I think now, you know, the question is, what do we do with the live stream programming to make it as welcoming, as interactive, as engaging as possible? And how do we use it to drive more and more people into booths who then click on start live chat and talk to the people in the booths? Um, yeah. But that was our first real takeaway. John, uh, would you like to add on to that? Yeah, I'll just mention, uh, so the fact that more than 55, I think we, for the virtual marathon expo, we creeped up close to 60, maybe just a little over 60% of those that were attending our virtual expo were from, were, were attending via a mobile device. And that to our team internally was shocking. Um, and I think our biggest takeaway from that single fact is to Sam's point, I mean, to, to Shelly's point as well, how do we design so that it's easily accessible via mobile device, how is it engaging that, that touch point and that engagement via phone or tablet was not in our radar. We were, we were designing based off of a desktop ex user experience. And when I was looking at, on the flip side, the Google Analytics of understanding where people were coming from to the expo page, you can design an Instagram post very well. And, you know, you, there are millennials that take, you know, online courses seemingly all day about how to do that and how do you drive traffic or how do you call out certain things. So Instagram, Facebook, a lot of these social media feeds are all being done on phones. And I mean, kind of now that's like a aha moment of like, well, of course, if I'm on my phone and somebody's in a Facebook group of, you know, the Central Park Track Club discussing about our virtual expo that we're posting about, then of course they're gonna just click on that and then go from their Facebook page to the virtual marathon expo. So I think for us, it was just a really interesting look into the habits of our runners and how we may not have understood that in the sense of their technology use. Um, from speaking just solely from the running perspective, you know, this whole idea of running anytime, anywhere is really attractive. Not everybody runs their best race at 7.30 in the morning. And when you allow and open that opportunity for, for runners to engage with your product when it suits them best, um, I think that that is a recipe for success. On the flip side, to Sam's point, there is that level of engagement that if I run at my best race at 9.30 p.m., it's gonna be hard to engage with the sponsor if I'm on the expo after I run my race to, to upload results and kind of check out what Bose is doing or what New Balance is doing. So it's definitely a trade cause and effect there. I think that we can do a lot to encourage people to go at certain times, but I, I think that this virtual world is allowing us perhaps a little sneak peek into the consumer behavior, at least again, speaking solely from the runner perspective, of our runners that we would not have necessarily had the opportunity to engage with or, or study a little bit more in the real world experience. Hey, hey so Michael, on the mobile question, um, I have a question for you, which is, because we're we are somewhat sure. constrained to operate within the framework of Event Hub mm -hmm. as it relates to the mobile UX, right? Mm -hmm. um, so. I guess I would flip that back to you and say, what's on the roadmap? What are you guys, what insights are you seeing in terms of UX design? Because like we, we, we agree, people are, they're watching, they're going on to the, the, the festival, the virtual festival page on their phone. Yeah. They're browsing the booths on their phone and they're, cons if there's a live stream, they're consuming the live stream on their phone. Um, but we're very yeah. much within, within the design and framework of Event Hub. 
Absolutely. So for that aspect, we've been working very hard at, at optimizing the experience and then especially the mobile experience. Um, I encourage you to take a look at Event Hub's booth in this expo. We actually have an item called the next generation of virtual expo, and you can actually click through a working, it's, a, it's what we call a functional uh, design. So it's not an actual piece of software, but it's, it's a design that you can click through and check out. Um, it's the mo it's the desktop view, but certainly we're applying those same learnings to mobile. What we found that real estate is just very, very precious and you have to be really careful and thoughtful about how you're actually placing all the different elements and then driving people to various elements within a, a screen that's about yay big. Yeah. I can line that up in reverse at the screen. Um, so absolutely, it's something we're, we're constantly trying to iterate on as well. And, and like you, we thought, oh, people would mainly go on their laptop, right? Who, who wants to really go to a virtual event on the phone? And the answer is, probably more than half or at least half. Uh, and it depends on the event, certainly, and it depends on the demographic of your attendees. But uh, the other aspect that we found that's been a, a really key insight across the board is that people are not attending, don't, don't, you don't need people to go for all eight hours of your event. If it's an expo or if it's a fair, people are going in for a couple hours, digesting what's most important to them. And then they're coming back and doing things on their own time later too, when it's comfortable for their schedule. So they're building your event experience around whatever their normal day requirements are when it's virtual, more so than dedicating an entire day or a weekend to go to an event. Some of those behaviors are the biggest drivers for us. Uh, we have about nine minutes left. I wanna note that some of you may be watching this directly on YouTube. We did get a report that a couple people were having trouble accessing the site. Um, any of those issues should now be resolved. So please return to the main event hub site to uh, wrap this session up. And then I wanna have, we have a couple questions. They're all around the same theme. So I do want to mention we have a roundtable today that's specifically on vendor and exhibitor pricing and sales. But with that in mind, how did you, how did the three of you each address how are you looking at pricing your virtual options, whether they were free, whether they were a fraction of the normal rate, and how are you looking to potentially keep those the same or change them for 2021 in terms of your vendor, your you know virtual booth pricing for a given vendor? When's the round table? <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's later today. I, I believe our round tables are at uh, 1030. There's three 10 minute sessions for that. I mean, um, <laughs> if anyone's got a monopoly on the, on the answer to that question, I, I would like to talk to them after this panel. Yeah, I, I would agree. You know, we did, um, we actually offered it to mm -hmm. our vendors for free if they transferred their money to 21 or at least, you know, did like a $50 deposit to 21. Um, mostly because, you know, we didn't know what to expect and we didn't want them to have this huge cash out, you know, outlay when we didn't know what would happen for them. And with the whole uncertainty with jobs in general, you know, we thought, well, we're just gonna offer this. And, um, and again, even with our sponsors supporting them, even the ones that couldn't help us this year, just to keep that community and build that um, in, you know, and keep that good feeling there. So we offered it for free. We allowed people to come visit the fair for free. Um, fortunately, we were able to do that. We did offer on various platforms a way to donate to the fair and that actually had a great response, which we were glad to see. So we were definitely looking at, um, you know, our normal vendor fee, and, you know, I don't have answers, but more questions. Are we going to charge a little more if they also want to be virtual? Are we going to offer that for free? And then are we going to charge people to come and view the, uh, the fair online? Um, if they're already there physically and they've paid to get in, is there a way for them to visit the virtual fair as a complement of that ticket? or if they're only doing virtual, you know, can they pay to get in, so to speak? So I'm afraid I don't have a lot of answers, but I do have a lot of questions myself on to, you know, what, what we should make that look like. And by the way, one consideration that you should think about is that it's a lot cheaper for them to participate in your event. They're not booking flight, they're not booking hotel. So whereas you may think you need to give it away for free, definitely don't because you're providing an awesome value. They need to meet your attendees. That's why they've engaged in your live events. That's why they need to engage with you for virtual. So I would caution against giving anything for free that you're providing value for. Uh, 2020 was, was a whip last year. In many mm -hmm. cases, we were doing whatever we could. And also our, your partners were getting hammered by the, one, the vendors that are going to be participating in 2021 are the ones who have figured out how to evolve their business to also get through this time. 
Um, and like anything else, they should be expected to pay because they're expecting value back from you. So I would say in many cases, it's not quite the same. We're seeing for virtual, for example, anything from 200 to 500 for a standard 10 by 10 to 1,000, depending on the size of the event or more. It really depends on how many attendees you're thinking you're going to bring in, how regional, local, or national your audience is. Not, not the one you're hoping for, but the one you have now that you can guarantee, right, and show with metrics. Uh, those are some of the considerations. Definitely, there's, there's the ability to charge for this. It's costing them so much less time and money because they're hopping on for two or three hours of live the day, maybe, instead of being there for 14 hours to set up and strike and all those things, too. Um, John, what's your, what was your take on, on how you approach pricing? Yeah, um, I also don't have a crystal ball, nor, you know, the, 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 this is kind of a moving target. Um, to be frank, we, we viewed our first virtual expo for this marathon as an, as an opportunity for us to provide um, to our year-round multi-year deal sponsors what the in-person races have been lacking over the last six months. So um, we were obviously open for business to anybody that you know wanted to, to be there. And we did have a few of those, um, apologies for the airplane. Um, we did have a lot of great interest from, from those that um, were not necessarily already partnered with us as an organization. But first and foremost, we use this as an opportunity for New York Roadrunners as an organization to create the platform for our year round sponsors to continuously activate within. So we, you know, we were open, we loved new business and we were going after new business, but that was not the sole priority of what as an organization we felt like was needed at the time for this one very specific virtual expo. Looking into the future, obviously things will be evolving. Sponsors will you know, be evolving as well. So we'll all be looking for new things. This was again, the first time in six months that as an organization, we were, we were able to put together a concerted and unified front for one specific and unified event that then we could push out to the masses. And that was for us um, a really encouraging opportunity to go back to sponsors and say, this is something that is going to get eyeballs in front of New Balance or eyeballs in front of TCS, what you name the sponsor. So um, that's kind of how we took a view of, of at least managing those expectations um, for all of our internal departments. Thank you very much. Uh, we are at time and I want to make sure that we're respectful of our breakout sessions coming up. Again, if anyone had any issues, I know that a, a few people have reported just some issues loading the, the site. You should have no issues. Our speakers are lined up ready and rearing to go in three minutes. So check out those breakout sessions on the schedule page. After that, we'll have round tables and then we're going to have our own live expo period where you can meet a bunch of associations that are participating um, and also some of our, our vendor friends that we've met over the years at the various trade shows that we attend. Um, and after that, we'll have another breakout session and then a closing keynote with conventors who produced the Boston Marathon Virtual Expo this year. They were kind of the guinea pig, one of the first to go of the, of the big races, we call it, that a lot of other races followed after. So uh, we certainly hope to see you through the rest of the day. Thank you again very, very much for coming. Um, and we can't wait to hear your feedback. Thanks again.